Pilots can't eat similar meals when they're working. Imagine that you're on a transoceanic flight. The airplane is flying over the Pacific Ocean. Flight attendants deliver the dinner meals. Everyone is enjoying the pasta. The sauce tastes a bit funny, though. Hmm, that's probably okay. After all, you are eating an aircraft meal. It can't taste like a five-star chef plate. Time goes by. Oh no, you were right. Something was indeed wrong with the food. But if all the passengers have the same problem, so do the pilots. To prevent both of them being out of order, pilots are advised not to eat the same meal at the same time. In such a scenario, if one pilot feels bad, the other one can take over. I mean, this is not an imperative rule stated by the Federal Aviation Administration, but most airlines make their own rules about this matter. Flight attendants have access to hidden equipment, such as a defibrillator, supplemental oxygen, a fire extinguisher, and duct tape. But probably the most interesting gear they have is handcuffs. These objects are there to protect passengers from others, and sometimes from themselves. Turns out that flight attendants have everything they need to defuse a troublemaker. Aviator sunglasses look cool on pilots in movies, but in real life, they don't wear polarized glasses. First off, they have a glare-reducing effect. This can cause some trouble in the cockpit. A pilot has to read instruments, but the stuff in the cockpit, such as LCD displays, emits polarized light. So a pilot with those cool polarized glasses can't read the displays with 100% efficiency. Pilots shouldn't wear these glasses simply because of safety concerns. Imagine a shimmer of glare coming from another plane's windscreen, but the pilot missed the sign because of polarized sunglasses. Ever noticed a hole in the tail of an airplane? Well, most commercial airplanes have it. Next time you get into an airplane, take a closer look. The hole has a fancy name, auxiliary power unit. It looks like a hole from the outside, but that is actually a hidden turbine engine. Most of the time, the APU will remain off for the entire flight. It will start working when the plane lands. It provides power to the cabin lights, air conditioning, and cockpit electronics. Don't underestimate the APU's power, though. It can also provide the power required to start the main engines. You've watched a bright side video and learned what the APU is. A perfect icebreaker. Unfortunately, you're not in a chatty mood. You just want to take the plane, land, and start your vacation. Yet again, there is only one door to board. You are at the end of a queue. Why don't planes generally have multiple doors? According to the experts, the biggest issue is that the bridge takes up a lot of space. When an aircraft is loaded from the front and the rear, it takes up two slots. This is not ideal for the administrators. Newly remodeled or constructed terminals tend to have dual boarding compared to the older terminals. Change of scenery, let's jump into a cruise ship. There are hidden passageways and secret doors in ships. These secrets are from an insider. Staff on the ship mostly work in their designated area. How does a worker get from one place to another without using the stairs and doors that the passengers use? There is a network of corridors and stairs all around the ship, used only by the crew. I mean it when I say secret doors. They blend with the walls so they go undetected by those who don't know where the door is. Maybe you can stumble by accident. Here is a clue. Pay attention to the walls near the guest stairs. Try to think of those gigantic cruise ships as floating metals. This leads me to a cruise cabin fun fact. The walls of the cruise ship cabin are magnetic. Imagine you're traveling to multiple countries on board a cruise ship, a single month voyage. You collect destination themed magnets and decorate your cabin. True Cruise fans know this magnet magic, so they put a couple of magnetic hooks into their luggage. Neat tip, use magnetic hooks to add extra storage in your cabin, hang clothes and accessories, postcards or hats. Speaking of ships, why do some ships and boats have small holes constantly releasing water? To keep the bilge free of water, water builds up over time inside the bilge, and the bilge pump automatically pumps the water out again. Ships don't have headlights. Using a headlight could prevent accidents. If they work for cars, why not for ships? Headlights are the source of light, but the light that comes out of them bounces back at the light source at some point. With cars, for instance, headlights work because the area you want lit is narrow, and you can easily take action if you see an obstacle on the road. For ships, this is super hard. 
The light source should be powerful enough to light the area the captain wants to see. Large cargo ships, for instance, need more than a mile to stop or take action. Plus, imagine how much brighter should the ship's light be to light the whole area in front of it. They do see each other with different sorts of lights called navigation lights. These are small but practical. They arrange it in a standardized way so that ships could see each other. The exciting thing is that they don't just notice one another in the dark. They also understand each other's movements and directions. Here's an example. Imagine a ship with two nav lights. The one on the front is lower, near the ship floor. The other one on the back is high up. This means the vessel goes to the right. It can safely pass by the other ships without hitting them. Trains don't have seatbelts. A bit weird. Every time there is a crash related to trains, this matter comes up. Pretty much nowhere in the world seatbelts are used on trains. Various studies have been made about this issue. Some of them created simulations of accidents, and the results were surprising. Using a seatbelt on a train could potentially increase the number of injuries. In cars, seatbelts are highly effective in protecting the passenger and are used all the time. The logic behind the seatbelt is to protect the person when a collision causes rapid deceleration. But trains carry so much momentum that they don't stop rapidly. On a plane, passengers use a seatbelt on takeoff, during landing, and if turbulence occurs. There are no such things for trains. Entering and leaving a station is not a high risk. Experts believe focusing and making investments are other ways to improve railway safety. Now, you are traveling by train. You look outside the window. There are small stones along the railway tracks to accompany you on the journey. Those stones are formerly known as track ballast. They do a very important job. They provide support to and maintain the tracks. They're not there by mere coincidence, though. Now look at the stones closer. You can notice that there is no single smoothly cut stone on the tracks because they're not regular stones randomly poured at the rails. Each rock has sharp and abrupt edges. Sharp edges hold on to each other. They protect the railroad from harsh concussions. They facilitate water drainage in heavy rain and keep down the grass and other weeds. Now imagine replacing those with round pebbles. They will slide down. Eventually, the ballast will spread out and tracks will fall apart. The last thing you would want, especially if you were a passenger on that train. Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place. Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI powered in flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh, those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners. Meet SkyNest, a lie flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four hour time slot if you want to take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie-flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind-boggling products. Check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites or Air France's La Première Cabin, which is believed to become one of the best first class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience 
especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye tracking equipment, the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi-transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. This way, takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Qatar Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q Suites. It looks like this. On the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space, or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long-haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you, without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in-flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys's air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all-electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co-pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well, not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, 
These days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel. And at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades. And the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier, which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on. But it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on, one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either, but when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you gotta have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter. You have the best seat, although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. 
The extra measures are important, as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population. You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach, and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea. But the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land, and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport. They're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary, as your journey has come to an end. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. 
Ok, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked, but even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. The airplane cabin is pressurized, and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25%, and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true? Or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape, so partially, this fact is a myth. But it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll. It's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage, until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle, and planes fly over this area as usual. Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality though, flying is a hands-on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true, or is it too far-fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And this is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? 
I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost $18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds drop by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true! The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kinda numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight. Duh. Now, in most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. Yeah, you better buckle up. If the turbulence is strong enough for pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare, but it can make the plane drop 100 feet down. Ride em, cowboy! Yeah! The average cruising altitude of most commercial airplanes is only 7% of the distance to space. Airplanes can trigger lightning, really. When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction creates static electricity. It can cause a bolt of lightning. Luckily, it's not dangerous for modern planes. On average, lightning strikes every commercial jet at least once a year. Shocking. On airplanes, the captain sits in the left seat and the co-pilot in the right. The reasons for that are historical. One theory goes like this. The first European air forces were recruited from cavalry officers. They used to wear swords on their left side and mount horses from the left. This way, they avoided getting their feet tangled. That's why, later, it was more familiar for them to board the plane from the left. Hopefully not while still mounted on their horses. Another theory involves trains. The first international air route connected London and Paris. And while performing this flight, pilots navigated by following the railroad. History has it that once, when the weather was especially bad, two planes collided because both of them were flying over the tracks. After that, it was agreed each aircraft would fly to one side of the railroad track, on the right. And the pilot had to sit on the left side closer to the oncoming airplane. It helped them to estimate the needed clearance. All right, so who'd want to sit in the left seat if that's where the biggest danger is? Um, it doesn't say. By the way, these days, both seats have full control of the plane. And there are no regulations that would specify which seat the captain and the co-pilot should occupy. 
Maybe it's just rock, paper, scissors. As for helicopter pilots in command, they usually, but not always, sit on the right. Copters are more unstable than airplanes. That's why pilots prefer not to let go of the control stick. This stick controls the helicopter's direction and altitude. The control stick sits between the pilot's knees, and they use their right hand to hold onto it. The pilot's left hand moves the lever that changes the blade's pitch and presses other buttons on the central console. The fastest commercial airplane ever produced, the Concorde, could fly at almost twice the speed of sound. It held the record for the fastest transatlantic flight. It took the speedy jet three hours to get from New York's JFK to London's Heathrow. An extra seat behind the pilot and the co-pilot in the cockpit is for flight attendants during takeoff and landing, or for inspectors who monitor the flight. This seat is also called a jump seat because when you get up from it, it folds up right away. Or in case of trouble, you can jump out first. Eh, not really. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. 10 miles away from another plane, and a voice starts to chant, Traffic! Traffic! 5 miles closer, and the same voice begins to give the pilot's directions. Turn right! Turn right! And after the pilots drink a lot of coffee, it chants, Bathroom! Bathroom! Nah, I made that one up. Airplanes can safely operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing at the same time is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would still have at least 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. Voyager was the first plane to fly around the world without refueling or stopping. It happened in 1986. The flight continued for 9 days, 3 minutes, and 44 seconds. Bathroom! Bathroom! The average cruising altitude is 35,000 feet. But if our planet was as big as a globe, planes would fly just one-tenth of an inch off its surface. <laughs> just imagine the legroom. Ah. Boeing 747 consists of more than 6 million parts, assembly required. Each of its engines weighs almost 9,000 pounds, two and a half times as heavy as the average car. Each one costs around 8 to 10 million dollars. Planes can land even if their wheels are broken or the landing gear is stuck. Then the pilots just skid the plane's belly down the tarmac. If everything's done correctly, such landings are quite safe, according to somebody. The first powered flight ever took place in North Carolina. Yay, Orville and Wilbur had the right stuff. Their gasoline-powered biplane, driven by propeller, was in the air for 12 seconds and covered the distance of 120 feet. And that's only half the distance of the wingspan of the largest passenger airliner these days. The Airbus A380 has wings that spread for more than 260 feet. A hard landing that makes your face turn white isn't necessarily the sign of an inexperienced pilot. In some conditions, a gentle touchdown is dangerous. For example, when the runway is wet, a plane has to touch down firmly. This way, it breaks the water surface and avoids hydroplaning. A hard touchdown is also necessary when the runway is too short. It improves the plane's braking capability. Mercury isn't allowed on planes. Even a tiny amount of this liquid metal can damage the aluminum aircraft bodies are made of. Mercury eagerly combines with aluminum. Then it harms the protective layer that prevents the metal from corrosion. By the way, Venus and Mars are prohibited too. The verdict is still out on Uranus. The co-pilot is as experienced and capable of flying a plane as the captain. It's a common situation when the captain flies the plane to its destination and the co-pilot drives it on the way back. Choosing a window seat, you get an opportunity to see how the airplane wings flex and flap. They're designed to move this way. If the wings were stiff, they would snap off once turbulence hit the plane. Well, that's comforting. Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. Good thing. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. At night, 
pilots can't see other airplanes clearly and have to rely on electronics. To make it less confusing, every aircraft has a green light on its right wing and a red light on the left one. It helps other pilots to figure out which direction the plane's facing and where it's going, and if you're going to hit it. Airplane constructors make the cabin look more spacious by painting it white. Its special wall structure also reflects light, which visually expands the space. The illumination between the ceiling and overhead bins makes the ceiling look higher. All this helps people with claustrophobia to deal with being in an enclosed space for hours. When an airplane has a wider entrance and is bright inside, passengers believe their meals taste better and their seats are wider. But the only thing that's different is their surroundings. Uh Uh-huh. Limited amounts of oxygen on the plane affects passengers' mood. This makes most people get overly emotional. About 41% of people admit to having cried while watching an in-flight movie. And 55% confess they feel more emotional when they're flying. Modern plane toilets are vacuum-powered. Yes, they officially suck. When you flush, negative air pressure outside pulls everything that's inside the bowl into a holding tank, usually in the tail of the plane. One flush uses around a half a gallon of water. The BDBD5 Micro holds the Guinness World Record for being the smallest and lightest jet aircraft. The plane can seat one person and weighs 10 times less than the average car. In the 1970s, when the plane was produced, it cost about $2,500. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin if possible. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't get shaken all that much. Bathroom! Bathroom! The pressurized air in the passenger cabin is as dry as in the Sahara Desert. It has about 20% humidity. A humidifier could solve this problem by adding some moisture. But it would be an extra load and cost airlines tons of money. Plus, the aircraft body is mostly made of aluminum and other metals. Humid air might lead to corrosion. Pilots are tested every 6 to 8 months. They use flight simulators and practice all kinds of emergencies. After that, examiners assess them. Safety and technical tests and medical examination also take place regularly. The Boeing 747-8, one of the world's largest commercial airplanes, has enough electrical capacity to power almost half a million flat-screen TVs. And the first airline that offered its customers online check-in was Alaska Airlines. That happened in 1999. In the beginning, this system was available to a limited number of passengers and worked only for selected flights. And now, everyone who is flying has the same opportunity to lose their electronic boarding passes. Let's face it, airports can be pretty annoying. But the most annoying thing about them is probably having to take the laptop out of your backpack and put it in a separate bin while going through the security check. But, of course, they wouldn't make us do those extra moves if there wasn't a good reason for it. Laptops are dense, and x-rays can't penetrate them, so it's easy to hide something dangerous there. If the device is out and on its own in a separate bin, it's easier for the scanners to capture something dangerous. Most airplanes are white. Is there a benefit to choosing this exact color? No, white paint doesn't make a place feel lighter. Neither does it save money on painting. Here are the actual reasons for the choice. Safety, efficiency, and comfort. The first airplanes had a metallic color, but the problem with metal is that it's prone to corrosion. So painting it is a great way to protect an airplane from corrosion. White is favored for several reasons. First, planes fly high above the clouds and are exposed to sunlight a lot. White is the color that absorbs the least heat, and white planes get heated less. Also, sunlight makes the paint fade away. A colorful airplane will have its paint fade very fast and will require repainting. And repainting is costly, so painting aircraft white is a more lasting choice. Also, any damage is more easily noticed on a white surface. So that's one more point for the white color. We always board from the left side of the plane, every single time. 
no exceptions. For some reason, the right side just doesn't seem to be an option. Yes, that's done on purpose. First, the captain usually sits on the left. This way, it's easier for the pilot to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, aircraft are fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. Since people board the plane from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed, and there's no danger to passengers. Consistency with the choice of a side helps to make everything work more effectively. Since everyone always enters from the left, all jet bridges are designed to get attached to the left side of the airplane. If every airplane had the freedom to choose the side, it would create an additional mess for the logistics behind the process. There are more questions popping up, like what does this black triangle drawn above one of the windows mean? Apparently, it marks the seat from which the view of the airplane's wing is the best. It's needed for the crew to find the spot as fast as possible if, in case of an emergency, they need to inspect the engines, slats, or flaps. This mark saves a lot of time. Next, the rows aren't well aligned with the windows. This is business. Originally, all planes are designed with rows and windows lining up perfectly. But when an airline buys a jet, they add some additional seats, squeezing them closer together. This way, they have more seats, which means more passengers, so they can sell more tickets. But you get less space for your legs and might miss out on a window. Also, all windows have rounded corners, and this is done for safety reasons. There used to be planes with squared windows, but those caused crashes because such windows couldn't withstand high altitude pressures. At high altitudes, external atmospheric pressure is lower than the pressure inside the cabin. So, there's a big difference in pressure inside and outside the airplane, and this creates stress. Without windows, this stress flows smoothly through the material. A squared window becomes an obstacle, and the flow of stress needs to change direction. The pressure builds up in the corners, leading to cracks. As a result, such windows break. Oval windows allow the stress to flow more smoothly, without disrupting them too much and preventing stress concentration. So, oval windows are safer. The glass used in production is stretched acrylic glass, and there are three separate panes in it. This is done as a security measure in case there is a breach. This way, at least one pane will remain intact at all times. Have you ever noticed those small holes in the windows? The tiny hole is actually only in the pane that's in the middle. Its task is to regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin. This way, the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane breaks, the middle one, even though there's a hole in it, will be able to keep the window intact. Also, that hole prevents the windows from fogging up. Now, let's say you want to relax and watch a movie. Luckily, there's a pair of headphones, but they're weird. They have a two-pronged plug. No, this is not some kind of advanced technology. This is a witty move to prevent theft. If you can't use them anywhere else but on the airplane, no one will have the urge to snatch them away. Outside the airplane, they're basically useless. And then they bring food. There are people who love airplane food and people who aren't very fond of it. But most will agree that food does taste different in the air. Turns out it's actually a thing. Low air pressure, lack of humidity, and background noise that we have at high altitudes change the functioning of our taste buds. They become less sensitive to sweet and salty foods, so airlines have to use more seasoning. Have you ever wondered what would happen if someone opened an airplane door accidentally? This wouldn't end well. It would be very dangerous to say the least. More specifically, soon there would be a lack of oxygen in the cabin. But gladly, no one can open that door accidentally. The pressure difference between inside and outside makes it almost impossible. It would take some immense strength to open it. The doors are designed to open on their own in case of an emergency. Speaking of safety, during takeoff and landing, the crew dims the light in the cabin. This is done for a good reason. This way, in case of emergency, you will see everything more clearly. Your eyes will get used to the darkness, and you'll have an easier time evacuating. Now, about pilots. 
They always wear those cool sunglasses, but the purpose is not to look cooler. They're used to protect the eyes. Throughout their career, pilots have to take care of their vision, but the problem is that it's not an easy task when you're a pilot. The damaging solar radiation that our sun emits is filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere, so the sunlight isn't very damaging to you if you spend most of your time on the ground. But it's different up in the sky. There's less air there, and the brightness is way higher. And with every 1,000 feet of elevation, the solar radiation is around 5% stronger. On average, aircraft fly at an altitude of 35,000 feet. This means that the amount of UV radiation is 175% greater than on the ground. This is very damaging to any person's vision. The large amount of time pilots spend in the air makes them vulnerable to different eye problems. And having eye problems can cost a pilot their career. So, wearing sunglasses is a crucial thing for them, and these sunglasses must be of the best quality. They should minimize the impact of sunlight and withstand UV rays, providing 100% protection for the eyes. Also, they can't be polarized, since polarization can mess with the perception of the cockpit displays. They should provide the best clarity, decrease eye fatigue, and minimize color deformation, so that pilots can see just like they would without their sunglasses on. You unbuckle your seatbelt and stand up stretching your legs after a long flight. You head towards the restroom and think about freshening up. Suddenly, you're in the air. Luggage flies around you. It feels like the world is ending. You're 30,000 feet above the ground and you're heading for a crash landing. Before you have any more time to think, everything goes black. In early 2001, a massive Boeing 747 carrying over 400 people took off from Tokyo Haneda International Airport. The flight progressed like normal until it reached 39,000 feet and coasting speed. Food was being served and passengers were up and about like they would be on any other journey. Slightly earlier in the day, a Japanese airline flight between Busan, South Korea and Tokyo, Japan had begun in a similar fashion. This one was smaller with about 250 people on board it had also started coasting at around 37,000 feet. Both of these planes were on a similar flight path, only 2,000 feet apart, and due to meet over the Japanese island of Honshu. They were both close to this intersection when the pilot of the Boeing 747 noticed his anti-collision indicator going off. This was when he first knew something was wrong. One of the critical aspects of modern air travel is the coordination of air traffic control. Every flight is monitored, and pilots are advised if anything goes wrong. The entire point of air traffic control is to organize flights so well that collisions are impossible. Every modern plane is built with collision monitors, but they are never supposed to be used because of this. While the anti-collision indicators buzzed, 26-year-old trainee Hideki Hachitani was sitting behind the radars at the control tower, monitoring both flights. The stress of having to oversee more than 10 planes was overwhelming him. This isn't surprising, given that he wasn't even certified to operate by himself without supervision. When he noticed the potential collision, he rushed to prevent a disaster. He quickly contacted the flight from Busan that was cruising at 37,000 feet and told them to dip lower trying to create a bigger gap between the planes. In his rush, though, Hachitani had made a terrible mistake. He had contacted the wrong plane. Instead of telling the Boeing 747 to reduce its altitude, the pilot of the other plane followed Hachitani's instructions and lowered from 39,000 feet to 37,000 feet, the exact same height as the 747. Both planes sped toward each other at 500 miles per hour on a collision course. Hachitani was beginning to panic now. When he noticed that the flight from Busan hadn't descended, he quickly instructed it to turn right. The pilot had, of course, failed to follow the instructions given because they'd been sent to the wrong plane. For an unknown reason, the instruction to turn right failed to reach anyone at all this time. 
the communications from air traffic control were failing, and the pilots didn't have any idea of how much danger they were in. When seeing Hachitani panicking behind the control panel, his supervisor rushed to the scene and took control of the situation. She contacted the flight from Busan and now told it to climb up. Amazingly, when she did this, she gave the order to a flight that wasn't even operating that day. Both of the flights ignored her because they didn't know that the message was intended for them. The Boeing pilot was at least aware that there was another plane close by, but his faith in air traffic control would have comforted him. Surely, if anything was badly wrong, someone would send him more instructions? At this point, the crash was beginning to look inevitable. For the passengers on the flights, though, everything would have seemed to be normal. They might have been eating some snacks, stretching their legs, or maybe waiting in line for the toilet, completely unaware that they were on course to fly straight into another plane. Luckily for all of the 600-plus people involved, the pilot was well-trained and confident in a situation that would cause most people to freeze up. Through his windscreen, he saw something that no pilot should ever see. Another plane heading directly for him. With cat-like reflexes and remarkable composure, the Boeing pilot gripped the throttle and steered the plane down as low as he could for the seconds he had before the collision. The Boeing flew straight underneath the other flight. Imagine being a pilot and seeing the ground in front of you instead of the sky. They both made it out intact. This man had saved the lives of more than 600 people. That isn't to say that everyone got out without a scratch. The passengers were completely unaware of the entire incident, so barely any were buckled in. They were powerless as the change in direction threw them against the inside of the plane. Out of nowhere, with the plane's sudden movement, many hit the roof with the force of a car crash. Every unsecured object and person were thrown through the air. Some might have even felt like the plane had just hit the ground. Miraculously, only seven passengers and two crew members were seriously injured, and the rest only received minor injuries. The pilot circled back to Tokyo to allow all of the injuries to be treated. Thanks to the quick response of medical teams and unbelievable decision-making and skill shown by the pilot, everyone on the flight survived. Every time you travel on a plane, you're signing up to shoot through the sky at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour in a fragile metal shell. You're surrounded by enormous, dangerous motors, six or seven miles above the ground. Surely there's no way you'd survive if the plane itself started to fail. The Hudson Bay landing shows that skilled pilots can overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. On January 15, 2009, Flight 1549 was set to fly from New York to North Carolina. The pilot, Chesley Sullenberger, was a former jet pilot who converted to commercial flights in the 1980s. The sky was clear and the conditions were favorable. It was a typical flight for all of the 155 passengers on board, until the worst happened just a minute and a half in. As the plane climbed to 3,000 feet, they hit a flock of Canada geese. They hit the entire plane, but most importantly, some geese got caught in both engines. When Sullenberger realized that his engines were failing, he contacted air traffic control. They ordered him to land back at the airport, but he realized that it was impossible. With failing engines and no clear runway to land on, he had to take control of the situation to save the lives of everyone on board. Without full control of his plane, he wasn't able to operate at the normal altitude. He flew so low that he passed over the George Washington Bridge at only 900 feet. The people on the bridge were terrified to see the plane so close, but they had no idea how bad things were on board. With the plane speeding at 140 miles per hour, Sullenberger saw the Hudson River in front of him, and he had no choice but to land on it. Everyone in the control tower was shocked to hear what he had to do, but there was no other option. Landing on a runway is one thing, but commercial pilots aren't trained to land in a river. Sullenberger had to think clearly and plan the landing while flying towards the ground. 
he made sure to allow the tail to touch the water before the nose. Landing nose first would compromise the engines further and cause even more damage. Amazingly, the plane touched down on the water without falling apart. Their momentum gradually decreased until they were at a slow, steady pace across the surface. From a distance, people might have thought it was just a slow-moving boat. A ferry arrived impressively quickly to fetch the stranded passengers, who waited on the wings and the inflatable slides. Everyone received minor injuries from the collision with the river, but they all survived. Captain Sullenberger went down in history as one of the most remarkable pilots ever, having saved so many people from a seemingly hopeless situation. There was even a movie made about his heroics. A shadow is cast when you have an object in the path of light. Light travels in a straight line, which is why you always get a shadow when something's in front of a light source. Birds and airplanes are no exception. They do cast shadows, but we can't see them. The closer the object to a source of light, the denser its shadow, and vice versa. If the object is too far away, its shadow disperses. A commercial airplane flies at 35,000 to 40,000 feet. At such a height, you barely see the plane, let alone its shadow. It's too far from the Earth's surface, so its shadow is scattered and you can't see it. The same goes for birds. But if there was a giant asteroid passing by the Earth, you'd see its shadow, based on the same principle by which lunar and solar eclipses work. A solar eclipse is when the moon is directly between the Earth and the sun, blocking the sun's rays. That casts a shadow on some parts of the Earth. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's also 400 times closer to our planet than the star, which is why they seem the same size in the sky. But since the moon is smaller, its shadow is not big enough to cover the whole Earth, so it's only cast to some parts of it. Lightning is never a triangle, straight line, or circle. It has a zigzag shape. Lightning is an electric current, like those you have in your house, except this one is much more powerful. It always takes the path of least resistance. There are lots of things in the air, like dust particles, gases, and other substances, so it's uneven and irregular. Let's say you have a mound of sand. When you pour water, it won't flow downward in a straight line, but in specific patterns, seeking the best way through the sand. The same happens with lightning. Antarctica has icebergs that look like giant ocean waves frozen in motion. Despite their appearance, these formations are created over long periods of time. The ice got lifted, compacted, and shaped by the wind and other elements, accidentally taking the wave shape in the end. Blood Falls is a glacier in Antarctica that pours out some sort of red liquid that looks like blood. Scientists say it happens because there's a salty lake with a large iron content under the glacier. Salt water freezes at a lower point than fresh water, so it melts the ice above, letting the river flow. This is the coldest glacier on our planet, which is why the water can constantly flow without melting it. And the red color is because of the iron in the water. Antarctica is the only continent where you can't find reptiles. They're cold-blooded, which means they depend on heat from their environment to keep their bodies warm and can't survive in cold, icy regions such as Antarctica. Penguins can relax. No snakes or crocodiles to bother them there. Only a quarter of the Sahara Territory is sand. There are mountains and oases, but most of the desert is covered in gravel. And it's not the biggest desert on Earth. Antarctica is. Just like people, trees also stop growing at a certain age. Scientists think this could be because when a tree gets old and reaches a certain height, it has trouble pulling water from the soil and pumping it all the way to the top because of gravity. Some trees, like the baobab, start growing out instead of up when they get to their full height. The baobab expands up to 0.4 inches every year. Australia is atop of one of the world's fastest moving tectonic plates. It moves 2.5 inches northward every year, which is about the rate our fingernails and hair grow. If you feel like trying to find something to watch on TV is just wasting your life, studies agree. The average person spends 1.3 years flipping between channels and trying to find something worthy of their attention. You can see a rainbow at night, too. It's a rare phenomenon called a lunar rainbow or moonbow. 
and it appears when moonlight is reflected and dispersed through moisture and water droplets in the atmosphere. Lunar rainbows mostly occur in areas with high rainfall or even near waterfalls surrounded by mist. When you crack an egg on land, it can turn into a mess, but 60 feet under the ocean, there's 2.8 times the atmospheric pressure on the egg, which is why it holds together like there's an invisible shell and looks like some sort of weird jellyfish. Stars don't actually twinkle. Their light is constant and steady, but when it interferes with Earth's atmosphere, it bumps and bounces through the air, which bends the light. Different layers of air are constantly moving, which changes the bending of the light too, so it looks like twinkling. Hudson Bay, Canada is the area where gravity is lower than in other parts of our planet. It's not like people there are free-floating like in space, but it may feel like some sort of a natural geographical diet. Lower gravity leads to less density, so you'd weigh less there than anywhere else. Gravity depends on the density of the Earth, so it's uneven. When the last ice age hit, Hudson Bay was covered by a two-mile-thick glacier. It was heavy, so it kept pushing down on the rock underneath it. Over 20,000 years ago, the glaciers began to melt, but the bay region was left deformed due to heavy ice that used to be there. The only sport someone played on the moon was golf. In 1971, an astronaut went to the moon and hit two golf balls, sending them flying through the low-gravity atmosphere on the lunar surface. The Great Wall of China is 5,000 miles long, so it would take you about 18 months to walk its length. Contrary to popular belief, you can't see it from space with your bare eyes. Lobsters are not biologically immortal. They age through time, but also produce a special enzyme that's in charge of repairing their cells. It also replicates their DNA indefinitely, so they can live for a very, very long time. If you went to the deepest part of the ocean, you'd feel an incredibly strong pressure, more than eight tons per square inch, which is like having 50 jumbo jets lying on top of you. The sun is the biggest object you can find in our solar system. While there are so many rocky planets, gas giants, asteroids, and dwarf planets, the sun still makes up 99.8% of the total mass of our system. The sun is in the most stable stage of its life cycle at the moment, but in around five billion years, it will run out of hydrogen, its fuel. We can see sunsets because the atmosphere of our planet acts like a prism. Science calls it scattering. There's more distance between us and the sun at the time of sunset, meaning more particles and molecules are in the air. They scatter some of the short wavelength violet and blue light off in different directions. This process happens millions of times before the beam of sunlight gets to our eyes. And that's when we see some other colors of the spectrum, such as orange or yellow. Tsunamis can reach a speed of more than 500 miles per hour, which is as fast as a jet plane. They retain the energy, which means they can move across the ocean and almost not lose energy at all until they reach the shore. Octopuses are some of the most intelligent creatures in the sea. They navigate through mazes, solve problems, and have pretty good short-term memory. Scientists believe they're so smart because they live a pretty dynamic life. They move fast, hide in unpredictable places, expand across new habitats, move in unusual patterns, and let their tentacles into crevices for food. This is all challenging enough for their brain to develop all the time. The famous heads, known as Maui statues on Easter Island, have bodies too. They're just hidden beneath the surface. There are also 900 Maui statues on the island. Scientists discovered New Zealand is part of a larger landmass that lies under the water. 94% of the total land is under the surface. It's called Zealandia and is considered to be a microcontinent. Maybe it'll even be the eighth on the list someday. You turn the ignition key and hear the whir of the propeller in front of the cockpit. It gets quicker and quicker until it's a blur and the plane begins to move forward down the runway. You're a trainee pilot and this is your first supervised flight in a light aircraft. The instructor gives you an enthusiastic nod and you begin to fly the plane upwards. Once you're in the air, you begin to relax until you hear a loud bang. Suddenly, the engine gets very quiet and the propeller slows to a stop. You're losing control of your plane and with no way to maintain your speed, you're heading towards a crash landing. 
You've come too far to turn back, so the instructor quickly shouts instructions to you. For every 1,000 feet of lost altitude, a plane can glide for 1.5 miles. Light aircraft fly at low altitudes, so you're in a race against the clock to find a makeshift runway for your emergency landing. An enormous forest stretches out below you, but you can see a lake in the distance, so you ask the instructor whether you can land there. He urgently tells you not to. Hitting the water at this speed would badly damage the plane, and it would sink before you could get out. The plane gets closer and closer to the ground, and an explosive end. You pass the lake, and he tells you to land on the long stretch of road that runs through the forest. You need to find a stretch that's straight enough to land at speed and free of obstructions, like roadside trees. The plane is scarily close to the ground, but luckily, the forest begins to thin, and the road straightens out enough to try the landing. It's now or never, so you begin your preparations. You cut the speed to about 60 miles an hour and try to avoid the drivers below. You carefully dodge electricity lines and road signs as you hover a few feet above the ground. People begin to swerve out of the road in panic when they see the out-of-control plane. You fly into the air as your wheels bounce off the road. Your nerve holds, and you manage to pilot it to a safe landing. Even though normal roads are not meant for planes, they're still straight pieces of asphalt, just like you'd find in an airfield. So, in an emergency, they make a perfect runway. This has even become a common practice in some parts of the world. In Australia, an entire air ambulance unit often lands on the local roads. The pilots need to be taught how to do this so they can get to the remote corners of the country in case of an emergency. In the outback, this is often vital for anyone unlucky enough to find themselves on the wrong side of the country's wildlife. Australia has 100 species of venomous snakes and 10,000 species of venomous spiders. So this is more common than you might expect. When someone gets bitten in the wilderness, the rescue planes need to land somewhere nearby. They can't land on the soft, sandy ground because the planes are far too heavy. That only leaves the roads. This is such a problem for them that the people in Australia designed special roads for landing planes. They look like normal roads for cars, but with aviation markings to help the pilots land. There are also small pockets on the sides of the runway for aircraft parking. If you drove down one of these roads, you'd see special signs warning you that an airplane could suddenly appear. Luckily, there isn't much traffic in the outback, so cars and planes rarely meet each other. The only problem with landing in places this deserted is the lack of illumination. It's hard for the pilot to find a landing strip in the dark. In 2015, near South Florida, a pilot was flying a Piper PA-24 Comanche light engine airplane. He was cleared to land at one of the airports, but the landing was delayed. He was forced to circle around the airport for so long that he ran out of fuel. The places he saw that were close enough to land on were a swamp, which was a terrible option, and a highway. It was 8.45 a.m., rush hour. But still, the pilot steered the plane toward the busy road. The plane's engine wasn't running, so it flew silently towards the unsuspecting commuters. Most of them wouldn't have noticed it until it was only a few feet away. The pilot desperately tried to avoid highway signs, streetlights, and power lines. He was gradually losing altitude, and it was time to land. The pilot tried to warn the drivers of his approach, but it was no use. One of the drivers, Daniel, was relaxing on his drive to work. He nodded along to his favorite song and thought about what he was going to eat for lunch. Suddenly, the whole car shook. He looked behind him to see the roof of his car being sliced into pieces by a giant propeller. The screeching noise of the tearing metal and fear almost caused Daniel to lose control. But he kept his hands firmly on the wheel and hoped the propeller wouldn't reach him. Seconds later, the plane slowed to a stop. Amazingly, no one was hurt in the incident, and even the plane sustained almost no damage. It's a shame that the same couldn't be said for Daniel's car. Daniel had always been a cautious driver, 
and this was his first accident, ironically, with an airplane. It was such a stressful flight for the plane's pilot that while police and rescue workers were figuring out how to get the plane out of the way, he just laid down on its wing and took a nap. Another incident happened in California. The plane's engine failed right in the air. Once again, the highway was chosen as the landing spot. This time, the oncoming traffic lanes were separated by a green strip of lawn, and the pilot skillfully landed on it. There was no damage to the cars, the plane, or the pilot himself. Planes landing on the road are pretty common in some parts of America. Cantwell, Alaska has such a small population that the roads are mostly empty, so planes often use the highway alongside the cars. People come to the grocery store and see planes in the parking lot. Light planes don't weigh much more than a couple of cars, so the asphalt can easily carry them. They can also easily fit in the bounds of the road. Once planes reach a certain size, that becomes impossible. Take the small commercial Boeing 737, for example. Its wingspan of around 110 feet is double the width of even the biggest four-lane roads, which tend to measure in at about 60 feet. If one of these planes had to land on a road, its wings would smash into signs and lampposts. In an emergency, these issues might not be enough to stop pilots from landing on roads. The real problem with larger planes landing on normal roads is that they haven't been designed to carry the plane's weight. Commercial aircraft can weigh more than 90 tons, but roads never have to carry anything heavier than a truck. Now imagine a heavy Boeing trying to land on regular asphalt. As soon as it touches the ground, the wheels would plow straight through the surface, like skis through the snow. The plane's landing gear would get stuck in the ground, and the entire plane might even flip over. So, commercial pilots would definitely look for another place to land. Even though it might sound counterintuitive, one of the better landing options for huge commercial planes is water. There have been a few cases of emergency water landings, but the most famous was the miracle on the Hudson. In 2009, an Airbus A320 took off from New York City and was on its way to Seattle. But 90 seconds after takeoff, it collided with a flock of Canada geese. They hit both of the plane's engines, and seconds later, the turbines stopped working. At an altitude of 3,200 feet, the decision was made to turn the plane south toward the Hudson River. The plane glided towards the George Washington Bridge, almost touching it, and then prepared to land. The plane was fully fueled and heavy, so the impact on the water was huge. Nevertheless, the 155 people on board, including the crew, were practically unharmed. They were evacuated through the emergency exits and waited for help on the wings of the plane. Another miracle occurred in 1956 in the Pacific Ocean. A Boeing 377 Stratocruiser was on its way from Hawaii to San Francisco at night. On the way, one engine broke down and another partially failed. The crew realized that they wouldn't be able to fly to the nearest airport, so they contacted the Ocean Station November, a Coast Guard vessel that was sailing nearby. To reduce the weight of the plane, the pilots flew in circles, burning fuel. By dawn, they were ready to land the plane on the water. The pilots reduced altitude as much as possible and shut off the engine to drop the speed. The plane then touched down safely on the water. Soon after, the rescue vessels arrived and rescued all the passengers. None of the people were hurt or even seriously injured. The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued, and just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. 
But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81 nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, "Uh, We're done here. De-icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, Several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew, unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable. But was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? 
When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, we're crashing to the ground. Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle. But it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training, at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And he never returned to piloting commercial planes. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough filled with snow and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there is one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. 
Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the U.S. president, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area. 
stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircraft flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m., on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Lilio Kalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii. On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway, all the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorns Timer, 44 years old, who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on their routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, the plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect, which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. The first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward, and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. 
he prodded the speed brakes into action and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through, and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kaolui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage 
and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, half the roof falling off, it's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing. But it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin. So you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, 
there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4 to 5 times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask, and pilots must always remain conscious. The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, but not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shake. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. Now, maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. 
All right, window seat on a flight to Hawaii. You get comfy and are about to have the flight of your life. As it goes on, you look out to the darkness and can't even see the clouds as you're cruising above the ocean. You notice that the flight attendant is asking everyone to shut the shades on the windows, including yours. The reason is that they want the passengers to be comfortable with the lighting. If an emergency happens, it'll take your eyes more time to adjust if there is light coming from the outside of the plane and the inside. If a power outage happens and the shades are shut, it'll be easier to act since your eyes are adjusted to the surroundings. Every second counts during times like this. Passengers are asked to leave the shades open during takeoffs during the day. And during a day flight, the cabin crew also asks passengers to leave the shades open so that the natural light outside illuminates the plane's interior. Now, there has never been an incident in history where a phone's signal interference caused any problems during a flight. The idea is that when you're thousands of feet in the sky, your phone signal will bounce off different towers and the signal will get more powerful. This normally won't be a problem in mid-flight when the pilots aren't doing much work. The real concentration and critical moments are during the landing and the takeoff. The phone signals will just flood the networks on the ground, which will make the pilot's job just a little bit more annoying. Now, it seems to bother you that the windows on the plane are so small given the improved technology over the years. The windows on airplanes are so small relative to the size because they need to maximize the hull between them and increase the strength of the frame. The overall frame over the plane is actually at its strongest if there aren't any windows at all. Metal fatigue occurs over time, originating at the weak points of the plane. The bigger the windows, the weaker the frame. You lift the shades just to take a peek outside. You're so far from the ground, it looks like you're actually closer to space than Earth. But you're only 7% the distance from where astronauts go. Planes can technically go higher than that, But they can't because it won't be good for the passengers and the crew members. Planes can sometimes cause lightning storms during a cloudy flight. But don't worry, you're safe. The static creates lightning whenever a plane passes through, and it can strike while it's moving. But over the years, technological advancements improve the quality of airplanes. The electrical current of lightning is distributed throughout the aluminum structure so that it doesn't affect the controls. Some people start panicking on the flight. All the windows are shut because the flash of lightning is disturbing for many people who are trying to sleep. One person panics a little too much and tries to open the exterior door in mid-flight. Well, this is almost impossible to do because of internal pressure. You'd have to be a superhero to open it up. The plane exits the cloud cluster back into normal sky. The flight attendants are bringing out some dinner. You pull out your tray and wipe it clean. It's reported that this is the dirtiest part of the plane. Nope, not even the toilet. After cleaning it, they serve some chicken and little veggies on the side. The smell is incredible, but when you take a bite, it somehow doesn't taste as good. It's because the difference in air pressure and the low humidity alters your taste buds, especially the sweet tooth part and the salty buds. Only a few hours left until you arrive at your destination. You wake up, and the flight attendants ask you to put on your seatbelt and tuck in your tray. The plane lands and parks. You're the last one out and make your way to the baggage claim. The conveyor belt rotates, but you don't see your bags. When flights lose your baggage, there's a pretty good chance that they're still in the location where you traveled from. Occasionally, they can end up on other flights due to human error. The flight agencies can recover your luggage if you file that they're missing. You read the signs on the flight destination screen showing the arrivals and departures. These signs are written in three specific fonts so that people can read them from afar while walking. As you continue walking, you stare out into the large window panels. These windows are made of special material. It makes you feel like you're closer to your plane than when you look through regular ones. You notice they're driving the bags to the planes for loading and refueling them before takeoff. They fill up the planes with just enough fuel to take them to their destination, rather than pumping them with a little extra. That's because they need the planes to be as light as possible, since fuel is heavy. You head outside and feel the hot wind of Hawaii in your hair. It's only a matter of time before you're dipping your feet in the ocean water. You try to find a taxi, but they're all taken. 
taxis are yellow because a salesman in 1907 had a lot of cars in his lot and didn't know what to do with them. He decided to start a taxi business to make use of those idle cars. To make them stand out from the rest of the cars, he decided to color them yellow. According to a survey, yellow cars are the easiest to spot on the street. School buses also use yellow to stick out from the crowd. Colors are important in our daily lives, just like the colors of a traffic light or the flashy red color of a stop sign. But it wasn't always red. In the early 1900s, the red dye wasn't consistent and faded over time. So they used yellow instead. In the 1950s, they finally started using a red color that didn't fade away and white lettering for stop. Well, you finally find a cab and enter. You're so tired and decide to shut your eyes for a bit. Scientists still don't know why we need sleep, but it has to do with resting our brains so that we can function for the next day. You get stuck in traffic and are jolted up by the sound of honking cars. You look out the window and see the ocean filled with people. Instead of waiting in the taxi, you pay your fare, grab your bags that the airline finally found, and head down to the beach. You dip your feet and pick up a large seashell. You put it against your ear to hear the ocean. Of course, you don't exactly hear the ocean, but different frequencies of the ambient noise inside the shell echoing around. The sound just happens to resemble the ocean. You take off your shoes to feel the sand on your feet, but it's so hot that you tiptoe your way to a shady spot. The sand absorbs the heat it can retain it. 85% of sunlight can also reflect off sand and water. You open your bags and get out your towel and lay it on a soft spot. Even though you're sitting in some shape, you're still at risk of getting a sunburn. So you apply some cream to protect yourself. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor, and the numbers mean how long it will take for the UV rays to affect your skin. After applying it, you dip in the water for a bit and see a large volcano in the distance. The sand around is somewhat black. This is because Hawaii is located in a volcanic range. The color of the sand is determined by the location, environment, and source. Most of the sand in the world is made up of quartz and trillions of particles that used to be rock. The deserts of the world used to be forests millions of years ago. But due to climate changes, everything turned to sand. Some parts of the Sahara Desert still have some geological formations suggesting that there used to be large rivers in the region. Not to mention the discovery of aquatic dinosaurs found in those ancient dry rivers. You're finally settled and sipping on a punchy drink. You see some people surfing the large ocean waves. Surfing was technically invented in Hawaii and later became a popular water sport worldwide. You hang out for a bit until sunset and then head to your hotel to take a long shower. Water was not invented in Hawaii, although it is surrounded by it. It's, you know, an island. You can easily remove post-it notes because their adhesive is not even. Sticky notes feature a plastic adhesive. It's spread out in blobs across that sticky part of the paper. When you slap a post-it onto a bulletin board, not all the blobs, that are technically called microcapsules, will actually touch the surface to keep the paper stuck there. You can easily unstick it. And then, when you want to reattach it to something else, those blobs of glue that are left unused will take over the role of the adhesive. Eventually, you'll use all the capsules of glue, or they'll simply get clogged with dirt. So, the note won't stick anymore. It's very satisfying to chew gum because it's made of rubber. Gum from before had an elastic texture because of something called chicle, a natural type of latex rubber. Now you can chew your bubble gum easily because it's made of synthetic rubber. Some of these are used in car tires too, while others are used in Elmer's glue because they mimic the effect of chicle. Office buildings are a bit taller during the night. When the employees are finished with work, they all go home. Tall office buildings get slightly taller. For example, a 1,300-foot tall skyscraper will shrink about 0.03 inches under the weight of 50,000 people inside, assuming they're all an average weight. You could actually heat your house with just 70 people. If you've ever been trapped in a small crowded room, you know people give off body heat. So you'd need about 70 people in motion to warm up your home in the winter using just their body heat. 
or maybe 140 people standing still. If you consider the house uses four electrical storage heaters and humans radiate approximately 100 to 200 watts of heat in normal conditions. Why does glass break so easily? It's because its atoms are not very tightly arranged. Unlike other solid material like metal, glass is made up of amorphous, which basically means structureless, loosely packed and randomly arranged atoms. These atoms can't rearrange themselves that quickly to retain a firm structure, so glass collapses and fragments shatter everywhere. Do you know why airplane passenger windows are mostly below eye level? Aircraft are way cheaper, stronger, and easier to build without windows, but they're there because many people like the view. Particularly about 100 years ago, when flights were often conducted at low altitudes. Also, if some passengers are feeling sick, looking out the window can help them reconnect their sense of balance, as their eyes are continually reporting what's going on around them. Windows in this position also help distribute the load around them more evenly. The floor of the cabin where people sit isn't all the way at the bottom of the aircraft, which is why windows end up being quite low compared to both the overall volume of the cabin itself and the eye level of the passengers sitting down. Water feels colder than air at the same temperature because it's denser. Because of that, your body loses heat 25 times faster while surrounded by water than it would if it was surrounded by air that was the same temperature. Since it's so dense, water has a high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of heat to raise its temperature just a little bit. Water is good at both retaining heat and cold. That's why the ocean is way cooler than land, and at the same time, the hot soup stays hot for a long time. Water is also a pretty good conductor, which means it effectively transfers either heat or cold to the human body. Have you ever wondered why water cleans so well? It's because of its asymmetrical molecules. They are made of two hydrogen atoms stuck to a single oxygen atom, which means they're triangular. That's why they have a slightly different charge on their different sides, similar to a magnet. The oxygen end of the molecule is slightly negative, while the hydrogen is slightly positive. Because of this feature, water is great at sticking to other molecules. So, when you want to wash away dirt, water molecules will stick to the dirt. They'll pull it away from the surface the dirt was on, no matter what it is. This is why water has surface tension. It's capable of sticking to itself, too. House cats share some similarities with big wild cats, but one of the things that sets them apart is their vocalization. The majority of large cats, like tigers and lions, will roar loudly so everyone knows they're coming to defend their territory. But with house cats, most of the time, you'll just hear purrs and meows. That's because of the physiology of their throat and voice box, which helps create these feline vocalizations, so a cat can either roar or purr. But no cat can do both. Bobcats, cougars, house cats, cheetahs, they purr. Purring is specific because a cat creates it when it breathes in and when it breathes out. Roaring has evolved in a particular lineage of big cats, which includes tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards, except the snow leopard, who lost this ability. They are capable of roaring because of the bendy bones in their throat. Mammals have their voice box in the throat, where air passing by its structures produces sounds. The vocal cords in the hyoid bones are the two main parts of the larynx that create different vocalizations in cats. You probably also prefer the pulse setting on your blender. And why wouldn't you? It just works better. And that's because of turbulence. When a blender stops chopping up food and starts spinning it around in circles only, everything you put inside is spinning at the same rate. It's not really about blending ingredients together, but about something called laminar flow. That means all the layers of liquid are continuously moving in the same direction. When you use the pulse function, your blender adds turbulence. So the fruit chunks are not just rolling around the sides of the blender, but they are falling into the center, which is when it's easier to blend them. So you'd like to open your window during a warm spring or summer day. It's so nice to hear the birds singing, and even when you come back an hour later, you'll probably still hear them singing the same song. They're hard workers, and the males are most likely guarding their territory and trying to attract a female. And other animals have their own tactics. Some like to rub their scent everywhere, but birds use a song to send the message, hey, I'm letting everyone know, especially other males in the area, this is my space. 
so they'll continue singing the same song over and over again. During the winter, they will most likely sing fewer notes to each other, or just one note. They want to let others know that where they are is their space. Plus, they're trying to figure out if there's any food somewhere nearby. Why do cats like small spaces? First of all, they are solitary animals, which is why they always search for a safe hiding place to take a good nap. And if you see a cat curled in a tiny box, it was probably just trying to find a nice warm spot to sleep and avoid the cold floor. Cats prefer room temperatures to be about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. A bit cooler than this is comfortable for us. And if there isn't a convenient sunbeam to lie in, they will look for other solutions, like a cozy shoebox. Cats are pretty lazy. They can sleep up to 18 hours a day, most average between 10 and 13 hours on a daily basis. The majority of cats are most active during dawn and dusk. They're not the nocturnal animals that some of us think they are but a specific category called crepuscular animals, together with other creatures like hamsters, ferrets, and stray dogs. Over millions of years, cats have evolved to become low-light predators. Their eyesight is adapted for activities during twilight. And since that's when they're most active, they save their energy for dusk and dawn. Before they became domesticated, cats would have had to expend large amounts of energy at these times, finding, going after, and catching their prey. House cats no longer need to hunt before each meal, but their natural instincts still encourage them to conserve energy for twilight periods. Why are four-leaf clovers so rare? Similar to animals, plant genes are located in small packages of DNA in the nucleus of each cell. They're called chromosomes. Our chromosomes come in matched pairs, but clovers have four copies of every chromosome per cell. There's a gene responsible for four-leaf clovers, and it's recessive. That means this plant will create four leaves only if it has a four-leaf gene on all four chromosomes. And that's pretty rare. Also, some environmental conditions like soil activity and temperature can also affect whether the four leaves appear. Interestingly, these anomalies tend to happen in clusters. So if you find one, look around you, there might be more of them. Why do cats like to like people? Whoops, that's supposed to read lick people. Sorry. There are a few potential reasons for this. First, they're collecting biochemical information from your skin. They could also be marking you as one of their possessions. Admit it, this totally sounds like cats. And it could be that they're just letting you know they trust you. Or at least showing you they don't find you to be some serious threat or competition. How come bananas get sweeter as they ripen? Fruits don't disperse their seeds randomly. They do it when animals eat them. At a certain stage, they suddenly increase their sugar content, which is how they try to encourage animals to eat them at that stage, specifically when their seeds are mature. Mature seeds have developed special coatings that protect them when um, passing through the uh, animal's digestive system. Do I have to paint you a picture? Why does our skin get wrinkly after we spend time in water? After 5 to 10 minutes in the bathtub, you will notice there are small wrinkles forming on your feet and hands. Scientists speculate that it could be the way our body gets a better grip when immersed in a slippery environment. Our wrinkly fingers improve our grip on submerged or wet objects. Also, they channel water away in a similar way to the rain treads on car tires. When you eat something really sour, you just don't feel it on your tongue. Sometimes your entire face contracts, so everyone around can see that you don't like the food you're eating. That specific sour flavor that causes this reaction is the result of the hydrogen ions that acids release when they mix with saliva. Yes, that's a mouthful of science. At the moment when your mouth detects this sign of an acid, it sends you a message in a pretty dramatic way so you can't ignore it. It's an evolutionary response that made sense in the old times, because many of the plants that our ancestors found in nature and later wanted to consume were poisonous, especially plants with sour flavors. So even today, your taste receptors light up and your face twists in a way that is out of your control when you taste something like that. Like this. A lighter color on an airplane is actually heavier than darker paint. The color white requires a higher solid content than black to get the necessary saturation. And the higher the solid content is, the heavier the paint is going to be. 
which is why white paint is one of the heaviest. But white planes are more efficient than black ones, although this also depends on how you define efficient. The white paint reflects more sunlight than the dark one. Different colors absorb different wavelengths of light, and white objects heat up more slowly compared to darker ones. This results in a cooler interior, which is why it's easier for the entire plane to remain cool. If your hot tea tastes odd when you drink it out of a plastic cup, don't worry, it's not just you. You might imagine that the tea is dissolving something from the plastic, but this most likely isn't the case. The taste you perceive is not just the action of your taste buds. All senses are contributing here. That's why strawberry mousse has a sweeter taste on a white plate than on a black one. And you get the feeling chips are crunchier when you hear those specific higher frequency sounds as you eat them. Also, hot chocolate has a better taste when you drink it from an orange cup. We are kind of conditioned to drink hot tea from ceramic cups, which is why seeing it in a plastic cup subconsciously makes us expect vending machine tea that won't taste good. Flamingos often stand on one leg, and one theory says that's because it helps them conserve body heat. One piece of evidence for that is that they tuck one leg up more often in water than on land. Others believe this is how they save energy, not heat. These birds are definitely more stable on one leg when it comes to standing for long periods of time. That's because they can lock the tendons and ligaments in their legs in a stable position, which means their muscles don't have to work hard to stay in one place. Plus, it's actually a classic look, don't you think? Why do repetitive noises annoy us so much? It's simple. They're constantly attracting our attention so we can't focus on other things. We stop reacting to certain repetitive sounds like ticking clocks really quickly. But some are just too annoying, like a slowly dripping faucet. The reason why this bothers us so much is the lack of control. When you know you can stop the noise anytime you want, you won't find it that annoying. Why do all planets make circles around the sun in the same direction? It would be cool to go back 4.6 billion years you'd be able to see that space wasn't empty back then, even though our solar system wasn't formed yet. There was a cloud of dust and gas in a place where, today, our sun and the planets are. This cloud was like a solar nebula, and it molded our solar system. Generally speaking, a nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust that occupies the space between stars and helps form new ones, together with the planets that orbit them. When this nebula collapsed, its center became our sun, while the rest of the matter got together and created the planets we know today, together with their moons and the rest of the rocky bodies like asteroids. The matter was quickly rotating, and the process looked a bit like cheese dough flattening into a disk that was getting bigger and bigger. Since the cloud was moving in a certain direction to begin with, all of the planets retained the same orbital plane too. Something massive needs to happen to alter a planet's orbit and force it to go in the opposite direction around the sun. Why do some people have such a good singing range? There are three things that can affect the general range of sounds coming out of your mouth. The strength of your diaphragm, the size of your vocal folds, and the shape of the chambers in your sinuses. But making the sound beautiful is largely a question of practice. Practice? Yep. At the basic level, you hear a note and reproduce it with your voice. But the true difference between being able to just hold a tune and having a lovely singing voice is related to the thousands of small muscle contractions that are mostly unconscious. They adjust your muscle mechanism where you produce a voice with the emotions you have while singing. Like with other musical instruments, a wider finger span can help you while playing the piano. But the rest is learning those subtle things like pressure on the keys and timing. Now, why do dogs hear higher pitches than us? Humans hear frequencies up to approximately 20 kilohertz and dogs up to 45 kilohertz. Nearly all mammals can hear higher frequencies than other vertebrates. Birds hear up to 12 kilohertz and reptiles, amphibians, and fish up to 5 kilohertz. Mammals don't need to hear high frequencies to communicate with each other but so they can locate where a certain sound is coming from. The special way of hearing that mammals use, binaural spectral difference cueing, 
works in a way that our brain compares the frequency range of a sound as it gets to each ear. Head shadows one ear, so some of the frequencies get absorbed, and our brain absorbs higher frequencies more than lower ones. And the smaller the head, the less effect it has on lower frequency sounds. That's why the animal must be able to hear high frequencies to hear a wider spectrum of sounds. A mouse needs to hear up to 90 kHz, and an elephant is fine with just 10. Dogs have smaller heads than us, so they're in the middle category. Why are oceans salty? Well, chemically speaking, salt is sodium chloride. And the salt in the ocean isn't just these two, but many other ions like calcium and magnesium. Most of these start out like rocks on land. Certain things like wind and rain erode these rocks, which basically means they gradually wear them away. So we can say most of the salt in the ocean comes from rocks. Minerals from these rocks leach into streams and rivers. They carry the salt away into the ocean. About 85% of the ions in the ocean are sodium and chloride, while magnesium and sulfate make up around 10%. And some of the salt that ends up in the ocean doesn't stay there. Animals consume a lot of it. But because of a steady supply of runoff from the surface, levels of salinity are pretty much constant. The ocean also gets its salt from one more source – hydrothermic fluids. Magma coming from behind the Earth's crust heats up deep sea vents. When they get hot enough, they lead to chemical reactions between the seawater and all the minerals from the rocks around the vents. That's why every part of the ocean is salty, but the level of salinity depends on where in the world you are. So, take that with a grain of… you know. Oh boy! You take your seat on the plane and look around. It's a large aircraft, spacious and new. You look up. Something draws your attention to that small compartment above your seat that contains your oxygen mask. Come to think of it, you've only ever seen it during the in-flight safety demonstrations. Ah, maybe it's for the better, you think, and relax into your seat. Screaming and powerful jerks are what wake you up. One of the flight attendants is saying something in an urgent voice, but still disoriented after your nap, you can't catch the meaning of the announcement. And then, right in front of your face, you see an oxygen mask. Uh Uh-oh. You place the mask over your face. You did pay attention to the safety demonstration, hmm? Then you grip the armrest and close your eyes, trying to calm down, however impossible it sounds. But do you know what's going on inside your oxygen mask? Well, let's talk about it. An oxygen mask deploys automatically in case of loss of cabin pressure. It might happen for several reasons. For example, some problems with the fuselage or malfunctioning of the valves pumping air into the plane. But most of these incidents aren't life-threatening if the masks deploy as they're supposed to. The problem with the air above 10,000 feet is that it contains too little oxygen for people to breathe. That's why once a plane rises higher than that altitude, the pressurization system springs into action. Its main task is to create the same breathable conditions as at the height of 5,000 to 8,000 feet. Now, if, for some reason, this system fails, oxygen masks drop. If this happens, it's crucial to put your mask on within the first 18 seconds after it deploys. If you procrastinate, you'll feel the effects of hypoxia, low oxygen levels in your blood, very fast. You'll become drowsy. And if you keep ignoring your oxygen mask, you're likely to pass out. Anyway, you acted fast and can now breathe freely. But for how long? And is it really oxygen that you inhale? Well, first of all, you notice with horror that your mask doesn't inflate. No worries, it shouldn't. It's supposed to rise and fall along with your breathing. So everything functions perfectly fine, even if it might seem it's not working. Now, hold on to your hats, here's shocking news. There isn't actually any oxygen in the mask. Instead of the gas, there are several chemicals. When they combine, they mimic good old breathable oxygen. The main reason for using the chemicals is safety issues. This mixture is way less combustible than oxygen tanks. Anyway, the chemical reaction that is happening in a deployed oxygen mask is the reason why you might smell something burning when putting it on. That's the chemicals mixing and forming the new substance. In case of a real fire, your mask simply won't drop. 
the chemicals inside can, unfortunately, fuel the flames. Oh, and don't forget that in your mask, there's only enough oxygen for 20 minutes at the most. This time is usually enough for the plane to get down to the necessary altitude. When the chemicals in the mask are all used up, the mask stops the flow of air. But by that time, you're already at an altitude where you can breathe without additional help. By the way, oxygen masks are not used too often. On US airlines, it's only been 2,800 cases over a period of 40 years. In other words, additional oxygen was necessary a mere 10 times per 1 billion flight hours. The average cruising altitude of a commercial aircraft is 31,000 to 38,000 feet. Why can't planes climb higher than that? Well, it's not that they can't, they simply don't. Because pilots can't count that high. No, not really. It's because if they did go higher, there would be serious safety issues. First of all, if a plane is flying very high, it takes much more time to get back to a safe altitude. During an emergency, like rapid decompression, when every second counts, it can become a serious issue. Plus, while traveling at altitudes higher than 38,000 feet, planes can't communicate with the ground services as well as they do when flying lower. At lower altitudes, planes can also partially rely on wind. And if they rise too high without any additional support, they waste too much fuel to stay in the air. Once a plane climbs too high, the air can't provide enough lift to keep the machine going. The lift is created by the difference in air pressure, but at high altitudes, this difference is simply not enough. Air may not look like something real because it's nothing material, like metal or plastic. And still, it's one of the things that keeps planes aloft. Let's say a plane is heading for space. Ooh. It has large, cleverly designed wings and super powerful engines. But the higher it goes, the thinner the air becomes until there's hardly any air left. And then nothing can support the plane and help it go further if there is a near vacuum around. That's why we still need rockets to get to space. But back to your flight. The plane is now at a safe altitude and you don't need your oxygen mask anymore. But one interesting detail gets you thinking. Throughout the entire ordeal, you didn't hear the pilots mention the details of the emergency even once. Well, that's because pilots are always very careful with what and how they say. They'll never announce anything dramatic like fail or malfunction. They downplay any existing problem by replacing zero visibility with some fog, something is broken with some technical problems, and so on. It's called positive scripting. Hey, looks like we've just jettisoned both our wings. Well, that should help us save on weight. Flight attendants are supposed to follow it as well. But passengers perceive pilots' announcements as more important and statistically listen to them attentively 100% of the time. At the same time, if there's a really serious problem you need to be prepared for, you'll definitely get informed. Now, picture this. You enter the passenger cabin of a spacious airplane. And as soon as you find your seat, you realize that for the next several hours, you're going to be crammed in the middle seat between two other human beings. But oh, look! There is a perfectly empty row of seats at the end of the plane. Time to switch places. But what you need to keep in mind is that by doing so, you might endanger the safety of the whole plane. Really? First of all, you aren't likely to be the only person willing to change your seat. But if a couple of passengers do it, they might upset the balance of the aircraft. And since most planes are extremely sensitive to any changes in their center of gravity, it can lead to very unpleasant consequences. Positive scripting again. Pilots must know the distribution of weight on the plane during the takeoff to make special calculations. If these calculations are wrong, there are chances that the aircraft will crash once it tries to leave the ground. Oops. But even if the worst doesn't happen, pilots can still have serious problems with controlling the plane. For example, one pilot almost didn't manage to turn the plane after just four passengers had left their assigned seats and moved to the front of the cabin. The situation was critical because the runway was unusually short. And if something had gone wrong, the plane wouldn't have been able to stop. It can also mess with the plane's balance if the airport staff load baggage incorrectly. For example, in the rear compartment instead of the front one. 
In this case, the machine can pitch up too fast, and the pilot will have a hard time trying not to lose speed. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change your seat on the plane at all. But before doing that, ask a cabin crew member if you're allowed to. Still shaky after the fright you've just had, you try to distract yourself. Luckily, you have a window seat and can watch the clouds and… wait! You suddenly notice the way the airplane wings are flexing. They seem to flap so much that you get worried they're going to fall off. Eh, no worries. The wings are supposed to flex. They're designed this way. If they were stiff, they would snap off as soon as the lightest turbulence hit the plane. By the way, pilots recommend that nervous flyers who are afraid of turbulence should pick seats in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence affects the front and rear parts of the cabin the most. The middle, over the wing section, doesn't shake that much. Maybe you'll feel a bit calmer if you know that airplanes can safely operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. And both engines failing at the same time is almost unheard of. But even if something like this happens, a plane won't drop from the sky like a rock. If both engines stop working at a high altitude, pilots still have at least 20 minutes to find a place to land. A plane can land even if its wheels are broken. It does sound scary, but if the landing gear gets stuck, pilots just skid the plane's belly down on the runway. If everything's done correctly, such landings are more or less safe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to land in our destination, more or less. When it's too cold outside, airplanes often get delayed, or in extreme cases, even cancelled altogether. First of all, if it snows heavily, such conditions drastically decrease visibility, making it unsafe to taxi and take off. During a blizzard, flight control may command the aircraft to stay on the ground and wait until the snowstorm subsides. Ice on the runway is another reason. An airplane's landing gear are nothing like a car's wheels and they can't be equipped with studs to avoid skidding. But even if they were, a plane needs to develop speeds on the ground that are much higher than on an average road to take off successfully. If the runway is slippery with ice, the airplane can slide off it easily. Things like this actually happened in the past. For example, in January 2014, the JFK airport in New York was shut down after a plane skidded off the runway and into the snow. Luckily, no one was injured, but the airport staff had to dig the aircraft out of the snow, and even the local police joined the efforts. Same story with landing, which is even trickier in freezing conditions, because a plane is in much less of a controlled environment and traveling at even greater speeds. What's more, while an airplane that's about to take off and skidding will probably get into an open area and stop there, one that's about to land could end up crashing into the airport's infrastructure. Needless to say, that's way more dangerous for everyone. Freezing weather conditions can also cause frost and ice sheets to build up on the plane itself. Airplanes are carefully engineered and any tampering with their structure may cause huge trouble. As experienced pilots say, even a thin crust of ice over the wings of a plane can mess with their delicate design and destroy lift. Planes can be de-iced though. The airport staff usually spray them with a special solution that doesn't let the ice build up on the aircraft's skin. But back to the runway. If it's covered with ice, there's little you can do. Unless the sun is shining, the chances of safely removing the ice from the pavement are almost zero. There's also a chance of damaging the pavement, making potholes, which can result in safety concerns for both takeoff and landing. Imagine driving over a pothole in a car at full speed. Pretty unpleasant. And now multiply it by about a thousand, because a plane is much heavier than a car, and don't forget that the landing gear is not exactly there for driving. Jet fuel and the equipment that pumps it can freeze too if the temperature is too low. The fuel freezes at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but that can only happen on the ground before takeoff. At a cruising altitude, temperatures may drop as low as negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but since the liquid is inside the plane and burning down steadily, it's much warmer there. On the ground though, nothing stops the fuel from turning into ice. If that happens, no flights are available, obviously. Same goes for the pumping equipment. Even if the fuel is still liquid, the pump may cover with ice and just stop delivering the fuel into the plane's tanks. In the worst case scenario, it might even break down, 
leading to expensive repairs and prolonged delays in flights. Finally, ground crews have to do a lot of work before takeoff or landing, and they're all human after all, so they can't bear the freezing cold for too long. This issue is often resolved by tag teaming. One group of workers goes out in the field to do the job, while the other is waiting for them in a shelter. After 20 minutes or so, the first group returns to warm up, and the second one takes up the job where the first one left it. Although it's efficient, it still slows down the operations a lot, so that might also cause delays. But despite all the trouble freezing weather can cause, it's actually more beneficial for a plane than extreme heat. Cold air is denser than hot, so planes gain more lift and stay truer while in the air. They're more easily controlled in flight too. Air molecules are slower and closer together, creating a steady flow of air around the wings and cockpit. At high altitudes, the air naturally becomes thinner as the air molecules spread out and become more scarce. That's exactly why planes can't get to the upper layers of the atmosphere. There's just not enough air there to create sufficient lift. The same happens when it's too hot down on the ground though. Air molecules get faster and spread out, meaning the plane's wings don't have as much air to push off and get into the flight mode. To take off in extreme heat, a plane has to move much faster to generate enough air resistance and lift. But to move faster, the plane needs its engines to work better, and that's also impossible when it's too hot. As the air gets thinner, the amount of oxygen decreases too and jet engines use oxygen in the atmosphere for combustion. When they lack this crucial element, they can't convert enough energy into thrust, meaning slower acceleration and worse energy output overall. So the problem is that the plane has to have a longer runway distance to build up enough speed and lift to take off, but it can't because its engines are not working to the best of their ability. This usually doesn't cause trouble, but only up to a point. When the temperatures on the ground level reaches about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, some flights can get cancelled because it's simply dangerous for them to try and take off. Other planes are more heat resistant and powerful, but that also depends on the heat. Some aircraft even have to reduce their weight by removing part of their fuel, cargo, or even passengers when it's too hot. Lighter load means better acceleration before takeoff and it doesn't help to avoid cancellations, but it also means planes aren't working to their full capacity. The average cruising altitude for an airplane is about 35,000 feet. They don't technically need to be so high up, but that altitude gives the best speed and efficiency. Air gets thinner at higher altitudes, which means less wind resistance, but less lift. For most commercial aircraft, the area between 30,000 and 40,000 feet is the sweet spot where the two factors balance out. You probably still aren't using a laptop from 1999, and your computer isn't flying at close to the speed of sound. Fortunately, planes have a much longer lifespan than computers. There are airliners from the early 1970s that are still just fine. They might not be able to keep up in terms of speed and fuel efficiency, but older planes are no less safe than their modern counterparts. Contrails, those white trails airplanes leave behind them at high altitudes, are easily mistaken for engine exhaust, but most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. Ever notice the numbers on the end of a runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. The lights on the tips of a plane's wings are called position lights or navigation lights, and they're used during times of reduced visibility. They help planes to see each other in the dark and can also tell pilots what direction an aircraft is traveling. The red light marks the tip of the left wing, while the green light is on the right. The third light is white and found on or near the tail. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down, 
The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. The plane rumbles into life and is soon roaring down the runway. You look out the window and your heart is racing. How exciting to be going on a holiday, finally. It's only once you're above the clouds at 35,000 feet that you get up for a stretch. You look down the aisle and notice that the cockpit door is open. To your growing horror, you notice that it's completely empty. The pilot's either napping somewhere, gone for a comfort break, or there's no one flying this thing. You ask the flight attendant, who tells you the truth. The plane is fully automatic, and there's nothing you can do. Self-flying planes are no longer the stuff of science fiction. They're already here. Many companies say pilotless passenger flights are simply a case of not if, but when. The issue is convincing the general public that they're safe. Some don't realize that once the seatbelt sign has been switched off, your typical passenger jet is likely flying by itself already. The autopilot can even climb, descend, and turn as instructed. We've already been flown about by an automated system. We just didn't realize to what extent. A commercial airliner can already land itself, though it's tricky to set up. Presently, two well-trained pilots are still required to be in the cockpit, for now. Many companies, such as Merlin Air, have been testing small two-engine planes to auto-fly in the Mojave Desert. Airbus performed its first fully automated takeoff in December 2019, though there were two pilots in the cockpit, just in case. Some companies are developing hardware and software to retrofit older planes. The aim is to replicate everything a pilot can do via a set of computer systems. The barrier, they say, is human rather than technical. Old-fashioned lack of trust. The technical term for fear of flying is called aviophobia. It affects millions of people, up to 40% of all flyers. They're still flying, but they're just not particularly happy about it. Between 2.5% and 5% of the population are so anxious, they won't fly at all. And yet, statistics continually reveal that flying is one of the safest means of travel, with nearly 95% of transportation fatalities in the U.S. occurring on the roads. If you were to fly 500 miles every day for a year, the fatality risk is still only 1 in 85,000. Or, to put it in simpler terms, for the average American, the risk of a serious accident is just 1 in 11 million. There are much higher odds of being struck by lightning. Companies may be well served by offering breathing exercises and other strategies to make their customers feel more comfortable. It's surprising that airlines haven't already implemented a variety of programs to make travelers feel more relaxed. After all, many of these air accidents are caused by human error. Being automated may be a safer option. Then there's the other argument that it takes humans to create the automated systems. There's no doubt, though, that fully autonomous aircraft will soon be with us. As the population grows, our cities expand, and there will be more need for faster and more efficient travel. Many people will be reliant upon flying taxis to bypass hectic environments. They already exist. Not only can they cover short distances, but potentially thousands of miles they can cover the same distance that a car can in a quarter of the time. They're much like helicopters in that they're capable of vertical takeoff and landing, known as VTOL, making them able to land and take off from almost anywhere. They will also be built of quieter mechanisms to keep noise pollution down, better than a train rattling past your bedroom window. They also use electric propulsion systems, which will keep emissions low. No endless traffic jams and mouthfuls of fumes. The difference with air taxis is that there's no pilot, with the destination locked in from the beginning. The challenge for designers is how to operate in environments with numerous structures, such as buildings and bridges, and how to navigate moving obstacles as well, such as other aircraft and even flocks of birds. Tackling a variety of weather conditions, too, can also make for complicated and even dangerous possibilities. Super storms, dust storms, snow, wind gusts, and even tornadoes can pose real problems. It's not like you can instruct your cabbie to take a different route. Or will we be able to do just that? Perhaps we could verbally tell the system to divert from its projected pathway. This is the same situation for planes, particularly in terms of weather and air turbulence. There is still much more work to do. Air taxis can only accommodate a limited number of people, 
though it's projected that short-range flights could carry up to 14 people. There is so much confidence in these vehicles that a startup company, Skyports of Melbourne, Australia, want to start operating a large-scale nationwide air taxi base by 2025. Other large corporations are also in the air taxi race, such as Boeing, Airbus, and Toyota. With larger planes already capable of pilotless flight, you may be wondering, why isn't this happening already? People will surely get used to it. Well, there are a few obstacles. There are regulations that are yet to be drawn up. Business people are already saying that regulators are falling behind and that air taxis alone could be a multi-trillion dollar industry within just two decades. Not all experts agree that the technology is reliable. Some pilots have also stated that automatics can malfunction and that someone must be there to take over. They also point to weather events that cannot be predicted and require the speed of human intervention. You could also argue that the pilots are going to say things like that because, well, they don't want to lose their jobs, and who can blame them? Yet they're not wrong. The Boeing 737 MAX, for example, was grounded in 2019 after two well-known crashes, one in Indonesia and the other in Ethiopia. The reason, in its simplest form, was due to flaws in the flight stabilization program. Incidents such as these only reinforce the fear. While pilots rightly say they've had to intervene when computer systems don't function correctly, in return, there's been documented crashes because pilots did not trust their systems and ignored warnings. There's also a very important factor to take into account. Research has suggested that without pilots, airlines could save $35 billion a year, and that's a lot of motivation. Regardless, the industry is changing, and there's increased development every year. Sophisticated sensors, improved cameras, self-assessing systems. Despite these advances, though, basic questions are yet to be fully answered. What would the automatic pilot do if there was an emergency? Could it automatically scope out a place to land safely? Could it put out a distress call? And how would it communicate with air traffic control? This uncertainty is what makes people fearful. We only have to look to drones to see what's already possible. Whether operated via smartphone or from onboard a ship, drones are unmistakably becoming more commonplace and performing an array of tasks. From filming whales to delivering parcels and long-range intelligence gathering, they map inaccessible terrain and use thermal sensors for search and rescue operations. They can even drop in supplies in disaster situations. They're literally saving lives. Their usage has tripled from 2019 to 2021 and is expected to do so again by the end of 2022. And yet, none of this is actually new. Over a century ago, the British developed unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs. They managed to fly a radio-controlled monoplane on March 21, 1917. More prototypes were developed over the decades, and in the 1940s, thousands of pilotless drones, or OQ-2 radio planes as they were known, were built. Many variations have been used ever since. Model enthusiasts have been using radio-controlled toy planes for decades. Drones continue to grow in popularity due to their high level of convenience and effectiveness. For these reasons and more, the technological advancements continue at breakneck speed. And yet, their full potential has not been reached, not by a long shot. If drones can be used for such extraordinary means, imagine what pilotless planes could do. The sky is literally the limit. While many are still fearful, people have already been flying for well over a hundred years. The technology is there. It's whether the public is ready, in a manner of speaking, to take the leap that counts. Hello, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard today's flight from San Francisco to New York. Fasten your seatbelts, and I'll tell you what's going on inside the plane at different stages of the flight. Passengers always board from the left side. That's because the captain sits on the left side of the airplane cabin, so it's easier for him to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge from that side. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. With passengers boarding from the left side, the crew can do their job undisturbed. If your priority is to get out of the plane as fast as possible once you arrive, pick an aisle seat near the front of the plane. If you want to have the most comfortable flight, Pick a seat in the middle of the plane, because the turbulence is less noticeable there. An even better option in terms of comfort would be those seats by the emergency exit. They have more legroom, and you can stretch. If you want the safest seats on the plane, your best option is the back of it. 
Once you're seated, take your time to spot the nearest emergency exits. Count the number of rows between your seat and an emergency exit. It can save your life in case you have to leave the plane quickly. You'll manage to find the exit easily, even if everything around is dark or if you're blinded. You'll find it just by touching the seats and passing the number of rows you counted in advance. Boarding completed. Time to get ready for takeoff. Cabin crew are walking down the aisles to make sure all passengers are following their instructions. Okay, everyone has their seat belts fastened and window blinds open. There's no one in the bathroom and the runway is all clear. Why aren't we still moving? We can go. Turns out the aircraft must wait for a while. It's all about safety. When a plane takes off, it activates two powerful forces. One is jet wash, a fast moving gas so strong it can easily flip a car. So no one can be near the plane. Another force is wingtip vortices that are the result of the wind generating the plane lift. These powerful rotating forces go from both wings and stay in the air for about three minutes after an aircraft takes off. If another plane flies into the air while the wingtip vortices are still there, the pilot will lose the roll control over the aircraft. The plane will flip over and crash. So, no plane is allowed to take off without waiting for at least three minutes after the previous one leaves. Back to the pilot's cabin. There are two people there, the pilot and the co-pilot. In case something happens to the first pilot, the co-pilot can take over. Both pilots eat different food to reduce the risk of them both feeling unwell. While the first pilot controls and adjusts the autopilot, the second one monitors the controls or communicates with the control tower. Also, there are checklists for safety standards to be satisfied at different stages of the route. So, while the captain is focused on the route, the co-pilot can complete the checklist and make sure that everything's going according to the plan. Flying is costly, so not only the passengers, but the airline as well want to make the flight as fast and short as possible. The shortest way is always a straight line. Still, aircraft routes look like an arc. It's because the Earth isn't flat like we see it on a map. It's a sphere. So, these lines only appear like arcs when we project them on a map. In reality, they're pretty much straight. Every airline and every plane wants to fly this most efficient way. But there are hundreds of planes flying every day, often in the same direction. So the air highway is pretty busy. The route data of every plane is pre-planned and is uploaded to the system. There are several of those so that the pilot has options if something goes wrong or if weather conditions change. The pilot can set up the right mode and autopilot can control the airplane within its uploaded route. Keep up the altitude, speed and direction. The pilots meanwhile keep an eye on the autopilot and focus on other tasks like navigating, planning and communicating with air traffic control. On the ground, air traffic is managed by dispatchers, who watch over planes and make sure they don't get too close to each other. The air traffic is especially heavy in some places. So, when an aircraft enters a busy zone, it has to follow a very specific route. There are also specified points called fixed navigational aids, or, shortly, nav aids. Those are devices on the ground that send radio signals in the sky that an aircraft can pick up on. There are also waypoints, which are geographical points on Earth. They're loaded into the GPS system, and an aircraft has to follow them. So basically, the whole route is flying from one waypoint to another all the way to the destination place. Time to start the descent. You can see the plane's altitude on the control panel. The pilots know the plane's speed, so they can calculate at what distance to destination to start their descent. If the altitude is 27,000 feet and the speed is 300 nautical miles per hour, the first number divided by the second gives us 90 nautical miles. This is the point they have to start the descent to maintain the descent path. There are also a couple of other things to consider, such as the wind speed and direction, or uneven speed drop. To descend, pilots have to get approval from the controller. Sometimes, due to traffic, they don't get it right away. So, they just keep moving forward without descending, therefore shifting away from the descending profile and land when the approval is given. Takeoff and landing are the most crucial and dangerous phases of any flight. That's because the pilot has less time and space to react to any occurring problems. 
in the air, even if both engines stop working, a plane won't just start falling. Instead, it'll begin to glide through the sky, losing about one mile of altitude every 10 of them going forward. So, the pilot will have about eight minutes to react and find a safe place to land. If an engine fails during takeoff or landing, the pilots will only have seconds to decide if they should still take off and deal with the problem in the air or cancel the flight. Even if something happens, canceling the flight isn't always an option. When the plane reaches the speed of 100 miles per hour, you can't possibly stop it before the runway ends. And getting off the runway isn't good, to say the least. To ensure everyone's safety, the rules at these stages of the flight are especially strict. You should turn on the airplane mode on your devices to make sure that the signals that devices transmit don't interfere with the plane's electronic systems and don't block the radio's frequency. You've probably heard that clicking sound a speaker makes right before your cell phone gets a call, if it's right next to the speaker. These sounds are what the pilot might hear instead of the instructions while communicating with air traffic control. Even a one-second interference can cause a lot of confusion. Just some certain types of cell phones can cause this problem, and if it's a combination of factors, the cell phone type, how far away it is from the cabin, and how many cell phones aren't in airplane mode. The cabin crew can't find out which of the passengers didn't put their phone into airplane mode, but the pilots will always know when many people didn't do it. You should keep your window blind open during takeoff and landing for safety reasons as well. This way, your eyes get used to the light or the darkness outside. In case of an emergency, during these risky stages of the flight, people who are comfortable with the natural light will react and evacuate faster, which is crucially important when every second matters. For the very same reason, the lights are dimmed in the airplane. This way, the light will be closest to the light outside the aircraft. Another reason is that if the window blinds are open, people from the outside can see what's going on in the plane. For example, they can see if there's a fire inside and where exactly it is. This way, they can plan the evacuation better. They ask you to fold up your table and put up your seat in the upright position to ensure that in case of an emergency, there will be no obstacles in the way. Everyone should be able to leave the plane as fast as possible. The passengers aren't allowed to use the bathroom during takeoff and landing because there's no seatbelt, no safe escape route with no obstacles, and it's not safe overall. A person can get trapped there during evacuation. The pilot isn't even allowed to take off or land while someone is in the bathroom. And looks like we're ready for landing. Welcome to New York. Tires on the landing gear don't burst because they're designed for a load that's four to five times as great as they experienced during landing. The wheel itself might break, but the tire won't burst. This little tip based on people's psychology can help you choose the fastest line at the airport. If there are several lines at check-in, opt for the left one. It's believed that you'll get to the counter more quickly this way. Most people are right-handed and intuitively choose the right side. Your skin usually becomes a bit dry during the flight. This happens because of low humidity levels in the cabin. Bring a good moisturizer with you to keep your skin hydrated on board. Do you know that airplane pilots always eat different meals before a flight? This way, if one of them gets food poisoning, the other will be able to take control of the plane. Airplane tray tables are some of the dirtiest surfaces in the cabin, so make sure to wash your hands frequently and clean that table with an antibacterial wipe to get rid of all those bacteria living there. If you're sitting in an aisle seat, you can have more space to stretch your legs out. Just push the button on the underside of the outermost armrest. This will move the armrest up, giving you more space for your legs and preventing the armrest from jabbing into your side. Here's a reason why they turn the lights off in the cabin. Passengers need to get used to the darkness in case an emergency landing happens at night. This way, their eyes are already used to the absence of light, which makes it easier to evacuate. Flight attendants ask you to open window shades so they can see what's happening outside. This way, they can choose the best way to evacuate passengers in case of an emergency. Almost all passenger planes are white since this color best reflects the sun's rays and prevents the plane from heating up. Another good reason is that white paint is cheaper 
Also, workers and engineers can easily notice any damage on a white surface. It's better to avoid making important decisions during a flight. Your brain doesn't get enough oxygen at such heights. This negatively affects its functioning. Chewing gum, hard candies, and mints can help you to avoid this annoying ear popping during takeoff and landing, but not because of the candy itself. You feel better thanks to the process of swallowing. Yawning helps too. As for the gum, it also helps get rid of that bad breath caused by the thin air at high altitudes, which pulls moisture right out of your body. Dry air can make you feel as if you're coming down with a cold. The air in the cabin dries out your nose and throat as if you have symptoms of a cold. These symptoms usually go away right after landing. The water they use to make coffee and tea on board isn't always clean enough. Yeah, many companies use very good water filters now. But still, it's better to ask for bottled water if you're thirsty. That tiny triangle on the aircraft wall over your seat means a lot for flight attendants. These triangles mark the windows through which you can see flashing indicators. Those signal the retraction of the landing gears and the closing of the flaps. Let's say the pilots find out there's some problem. In that case, a flight attendant rushes to the necessary window to check what's happening. But for passengers, this is just the best place for photos, since you can see the wings perfectly. Seats in the middle of the cabin above the wings are the best for you if you have motion sickness. This area is more balanced and shakes the least during turbulence. If you tend to get nervous during the flight, do some physical exercise not long before boarding the plane. A little workout helps lower your stress levels and makes your body release endorphins, the happiness hormones. Also, this physical activity compensates for the hours you spend sitting still. The turbines are located under the wings since this makes it cheaper, faster, and easier to service the engines. Previously, they used to be placed in the tail. It required expensive equipment and much more time to repair. When they started installing the engines below the wings, ticket prices went down. Imagine you're flying in a hot air balloon. See the burner system installed under the gas bag, also called the envelope? It heats the air inside, which makes the balloon go up. So, turbulence is the same hot air but created by nature. When the air heats up, it rises a plane. When it becomes cooler, the aircraft goes down. And passengers feel as if they're riding a roller coaster. A stream of hot air left by another plane can also cause turbulence. It's common for most flights, but usually, turbulence is so light that passengers don't feel it. Do you know that planes can fly even after one engine fails? Pilots can control such emergency situations and land the aircraft safely. Passengers may feel a slight tilt during the flight, but in most cases, they don't even know the plane is flying with only one engine. Your eyes get oxygen straight from the air. It's not delivered by the blood. So your eyes can feel somewhat dry during the flight. Put eye drops in your bag. They'll help you keep your eyes moist. It's forbidden to carry large volumes of liquids on board because some hazardous substances can easily dissolve in water. If a plane has to land on water, its wings become a life-saving pillow. Empty fuel tanks help the aircraft stay afloat too. By the way, it can be from 10 minutes to 60 hours before the plane sinks. It all depends on the model, weather conditions, and the pilot's skills. Those smiling flight attendants you meet when you get into the cabin usually hide their hands behind their backs. They're counting people entering the plane to make sure that all passengers are on board. Despite all the words people say about airplane food, it's not actually so bad. The problem is your sense of taste. It's not so acute since the air in the cabin makes your mouth dry. It also dulls your sense of smell. That's why airlines add a lot of spices and salt to their meals. Is it true that your hair grows faster during the flight? Not really. Scientists haven't managed to prove it. This myth appeared in the first part of the 20th century when some passengers noticed that their stubble had grown longer during the flight. It's normal for people to get headaches during the flight, especially right after takeoff. You climb to an altitude higher than Mount Everest within about 10 minutes. These changes happen too fast for your body to adjust. Seatbelts on planes stretch across your stomach to save you from getting slammed against the ceiling in case of turbulence. When it happens, the aircraft starts moving up and down, and your waist belt holds you securely. And seatbelts in cars protect people from horizontal collisions. Airplanes have special protection from lightning. Even if it strikes, passengers won't feel it.
Planes are covered with an aluminum coating that conducts electric current but doesn't let it get inside the plane. Electronics and fuel tanks also have extra protection. Plane seats are so uncomfortable because airlines try to fit the maximum number of passengers on the plane. That's why there's so little space between seats. Two additional rows means 12 more passengers. Also, companies make airplane seats lighter to save on fuel costs. Even seemingly insignificant extra weight can cost an airline thousands of dollars. And, by the way, your seat has a fire-resistant coating. It's necessary to prevent a fire from spreading in case of an accident. Airport workers transport unclaimed luggage to special centers. If the owner doesn't show up within three months, the baggage is put up for sale in specialized stores. You couldn't use your phone on an airplane in the past, since cell phones were really dangerous for navigation. Their radio signals could disrupt the settings in aircraft electronics. Oxygen masks fall down not only during strong turbulence, but also when the air pressure inside the cabin changes dramatically. Passengers are okay if they put on their oxygen masks, but in such cases are considered to be an emergency. And pilots do their best to quickly go down to a safe altitude so that passengers can breathe without oxygen masks.